Okay, I had stopped <clears throat> here because this is the beginning of a well-documented period of time called the Diocletian Persecution and the links to external sources are through this link that I put in my Ephesians document because Paul I, was the first guy I saw who, you know, documented it. That's how I even learned who Diocletian was. And um, that's part of this whole set of links here. This is farther on down on the same page. Because Paul does the same kind of thing that we're seeing here. And that's why Paul is being tagged by Revelation. To show, hi, you know, add these parts in Paul that relate to the same issues. Tag these, tag those lines in Paul on the end of my text so that you know better what this text is referring to. It's a cross-reference device. That's one of the purposes of meter, especially when it's a well-known number like 231, which is the number in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the actual syllable count. When you see something like that, you'll, you'll immediately remember, oh, that's Daniel 9, 24 through 27. That's the total number of syllables. So this is a Daniel 9, 24 through 27 type issue. And yeah, Paul tags it too. But he's referring you to Paul because Paul already tags the Daniel 9 meaning in his own 231, which is considered to be the start by some historians. 231 AD, but this isn't 231 AD in, in Revelation considered to be the start of the crisis of the third century but in here in Revelation it's 88 years later okay so when we go back up here that's what starts it okay it's called the Diocletian persecution you might want to take a minute and click on your link if you've downloaded this click on your link to see it either in the PDF or here in the doc Now, if you've done that, you'll have a whole welter of links to look at to get information about what is that, what was Diocletian, how did it lead up to Constantine. There's a, a vast amount of, of information to look at in that link that I've linked to all over the internet that I could find. But almost anybody will tell you the Diocletian persecution started in 304 AD, which is the end of this verse, 216. Sorry this is so complicated, but it is the Word of God, and it's and once you get it, it's like, oh my God, this is so divine, so provably from God. See? 304. So, Borneas Autis. Autes. You're supposed to say A. The, the modern pronunciation makes that an E sound, but it's an A sound. Okay? Corneas Altes. That's when the fornications, hers, start. And it is a type of fornication because Diocletian was pagan. He had some sympathy for Christianity, but Galerius supposedly talked him out of it. I'm not so sure Galerius did, but Galerius was definitely anti Christian, so it's plausible. At the time this was starting, Constantine was a protege of Diocletian. I suspect that Galerius was j jealous of him. Technically he was a hostage. He was in the care of Diocletian in order to assure that his father Constantine Chlorus up in Britain and Gaul would stay loyal because he was part of the Tetrarchy. So Constantine was there at the time. Alright? When this started. Constantine was a pagan too at the time and would remain one for another four years. It's a really biting story about Constantine. And you can read all about it here, because I go into great detail about it with all the links that, that prove the points I'm making in that link right there. So it's all in one place and easy to read online. And then if you want to see the Greek, you'll have to download BibleWorks fonts at BibleWorks.com fonts HTML. Okay? But you don't need to read the Greek in order to see that section, so you can use the HTM that's linked there 
and get all the you know the contemporary and uh, Roman historian links there. Okay. So fornications. It's a fornication when you're, you know, as it were, making love to another god, which Diocletian was doing, and so was Constantine at the time. And it's a fornication to, what do you want to call it, rape somebody who's not your spouse. It's, it's wrong to rape anyhow. But now they're raping Christians, as, as it were. They're, this was a really bad period. The, the, the order of Diocletian came in two edicts. And the second one was worse than the first, but basically if you combine them together, it was like, if you were a teacher of the Word of God, you got jailed. If you had a Bible, it got confiscated. Your property, of course, would be lost. And the only way out of it is if you would recant and say you were a pagan, which a lot of people weren't willing to do. This is the first documented instance we got in history where an actual persecution was mounted to find Christians and do this to them. Okay, the, there were persecutions prior, but they were mostly mobs, not necessarily the emperor's order. The closest thing to it was up here in Decius, which was basically a libelous, which was high if you pour red wine, cocicon, you pour red wine out on the ground, then, then you, you, you know, you're considered to be a pagan and you're doing honor to Rome. And we won't persecute you as a Christian. But a lot of Christians felt they couldn't do that. They didn't know Bible, okay? They didn't understand what Romans 13 says. So they didn't have a proper reply. Okay? Because if you pour wine or wine out on the ground, what does that mean? You're not pouring it out to a God. To you, it's not to a God. But if that's your sign of respect to the emperor, well, why not do it? It doesn't do anything to God. You're not really worshiping the emperor. Okay, if that's respect for the status quo or for the ruling power, well, so what? Okay, and you could say that and then pour it out on the ground and you would have been given a libelous and that would have exonerated you. All they cared about was that you respected Rome. Yeah, well, God says to respect Rome in Romans 13. The very book of Romans says that. Okay? So what's the big deal? But that's very different from here. Here it was about confiscating people. Finding and confiscating people. It was like what Trump is trying to do to round up um, undocumented, the undocumented workers, the, the so-called illegal aliens. Trump is, is actually mounting searches. It's, some are going on in Chicago right now. I got clients in Chicago who are telling me about it. Okay, that's when you round them up. You look for them. You round them up. And then you take away what they got, you steal their Bibles, you burn their Bibles, you burn their churches, you, you jail their preachers. That's what, that's what this was. The first real persecution of it, worthy of the name in history that, against Christians. It's going to get a lot worse, but it's going to get a lot worse under Constantine, who allegedly was doing it in the name of Christ. Okay? So Diocletian set this, this up. And it's classified as her fornications. Actually, you start it right here. Her fornications. All right, but it ends with an actual edict. So these words are what preceded it. Okay. And then the next word, oh, this is a killer. Kai. Again, we've seen it several times now truncated for Kaiser, you're just a mere conjunction. You think you're king, Kaiser, but you're just a conjunction in history. Okay? At that point, the next year, see this is 304, so this is 305, that's when Diocles retires to Croatia at Kai. He retires. And the other guys are supposed to take over him. Now, a lot of stuff happens between that point here and the end of the verse. And the verse is really biting. It says, and on her for and, and on her, this is a word for her, but it, you can use it this way, forehead were names written. 
Okay, well the names being written, this whole process here, is actually a whole process by which um, Constantine comes to power. See, you got, this is 305. That's Theocles retiring. Okay, 306, 307, 308. A lot of people say, and there's difference amongst the historians, that it was in 306, at the beginning of Epi, that Constantine fled the presence of Diocletian, of course, who just retired, and Galerius, who was, he was, he was the hostage of. So he was a pawn, and this is funny, a horse, Hippus, and we call it Aohippus, but he was upon a horse and riding, supposedly, I don't know if I believe it that way, riding all the way up to Gaul and Britain to his dad to escape Diocletian, to escape Galerius, and that Constantine's own rising upon his dad to power occurs here because his dad then dies. Okay, so that's three o that's three o six. This is three o seven, and by three o seven, somewhere three o seven, three o eight, that's when his dad dies, and Constantine is now being declared by his own troops emperor, replacing his dad, which is not what the inheritance plan that Diocletian had fostered. Okay. So they meet in 308 at Carnuntum. And now, of course, Constantine has all the army behind him and everything. And so Galerius gives in because Diocletian tells him to give in. And Galerius points somebody else. And it's, it's, it's not a happy time. But they, they end up walking away sort of peacefully. So on the forehead, this word means forehead. Okay. Me topon. All right. For the next three years, Constantine's getting his forces together. All right. Now, what's so important about that is this is this is 308. See, 305, 306, 307, 308, 309, 310 at Topon, the middle of the forehead word. You know what Constantine is saying to his troops, and you can find all this. I've got the links to all that. In, in there. Okay, you just keep on reading down. Okay, and that's the link to Constantine. But you'll find more links to Constantine and Diocletian in here. The very point highlighted there in black, in the middle of forehead, that's the word for forehead, metopon. Okay, in the very middle of it, Constantine is back in uh, Britain. He's assembling his troops. And he's telling them that very year in the middle that he sees a sign from Apollo that he will have 120 years of victory if the troops will fight with him against Rome. That was 310 A.D. Okay, and the documentation where you can find the proof of what I'm telling you is in that section. Okay. I mean, you can probably find it on the, the internet too, but it would be faster and easier to find the internet link using this. In the middle of the word forehead. Okay, the text is about what's written on the forehead of the whore of Babylon. In the middle of it, he's making a whorish claim. But it's not the first one. This is 311. This is 312. Ow, tis, her, means her, but it's two syllables in Greek. Ow, tis, self same. That year is 312. In 312, he changes who gave him the sign. He says, oh, I saw this sign from Christ in the sky that says, in hoc signo vinces, okay? And it was from God, it was from Jesus Christ giving me the sign. If you follow me and fight wrong. So here it was Apollo. But apparently there were too many Christians, so he changes the name of the God. So how much of a Christian is he really? Not. Sorry. 
Okay. So at Al, see here we got a Kai Diocles retires. We got I I don't have enough room to write all the satire here. In the middle of the forehead, there's the three ten vision of Apollo. And here it's three twelve, the vision of the the Cairo symbol at the Milvian. If 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 you fight to Rome, and the Milvian Bridge is the name of the the place where he fought with Maxenius and beat him, and took over Rome. Same year, same syllable. Okay. Now, two years later, at On, is it On? Yeah. Two years later at On, it's 314. See, that's 312, so that's 314. Onoma means name, and specifically, it, it means name, reputation, person. So, so the actual text of the verse is saying, and upon her... That's a word for her. Her forehead names were written. Actually, a name was written. A title. A title of her. Her character. Okay. But very often, especially in scripture, the word onoma is used for Christ. Christ's name. Okay. So it's the alternate. It's the antichrist equivalent. That's the play here of this word. So on on... The first syllable of the word Onoma is the Council of Arles. Okay, now the Council of Arles was held by Constantine, the first one. And it's hard to find this. <coughs> it was held in 314. And it was a bunch of Christians arguing with each other over whether those people in the Decius persecution who poured the wine out, Kokikon, red. Should we forgive them now? Now that we're victorious and, and we have Constantine as our, as our ruler and he's pro-Christian and everything. So let's hate other Christians and eat up and beat up on other Christians. Let's spill some red of our own. And all those people who, who poured the libellus under Decius, we don't want to forgive them. You know, Christ died on the cross and shed his blood on the cross. It's really a spiritual thinking, Isaiah 53, 9. Um, but we, we don't want to forgive them like Christ did. We want to be nasty to our fellow Christians. And they are called Donatists, the nasty people. Which is really hysterical because Dona means to give. And they don't want to give anything. And Constantine held his first council trying to mediate between these arguing Christians who want to persecute other Christians in 314. In the name of. In the name of. Now, if that's not names written that you know, wait till I get the Mysterion because that means church. In his name, people are arguing against other Christians about whether to forgive them and saying no we shouldn't forgive them we shouldn't let them back into the church so they were busy trying to write a new set of persecutions far worse than Diocletian had ever done you see how this satire is so biting at on which is normally used in the New Testament when you see onoma it's usually onomamu Christ speaking about his own name or in his name, Onoma Autu. Okay? Almost almost all the time the word Onoma is used for God. It's not exclusively used for him in the New Testament because it can be used for anybody. But the, it's evocative, okay? And that's when the first Council of Arles is held. In 314. Okay? And then there's more of it with Gegramenon, but I, there's just too much to say about this period. Okay? About how nasty it is. About how biting the sarcasm is. Because this is introducing the, on her forehead, the Whore of Babylon, what was written on her forehead. Which, of course, you already know. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and, you know, abominations on the earth. And in each case now, he starts, bam, bam, bam. John starts tagging those same 
sections in Ephesians. And in Ephesians, these periods refer to the severance, the severed mothers, because that's what they were doing. And then this is the period of Decius in Ephesians. So he's linking back to the earlier period in history that is like, as it were, the mother of the current period of history that's now fully under Christians, under Constantine, beating and eating each other. And that's how history will keep on going. This is the rise, this is depicting the rise of the harlot. See, this is the harlot. On her forehead were written, Mustarium, this is Paul's keyword that he uses in Ephesians 3, but he first introduces it in Ephesians 1 9 C. And when he does, he's covering 231 AD, which was the seven mothers who came into power on a on a claim that they had incest with Caracalla. Okay? Church as a harlot. Church as the harlot. And to make sure you don't miss that, he keeps sevening to the, na the same numbers in Paul that talk about this. Because it was Paul, that's first that I discovered it, that was actually making the link between Constantine and the severance. I found out that Paul got it from, a few, from Matthew 24, which is what started me on this journey, that's now, you know, we're at Revelation 17. Okay? So that's 319, and you have another council, okay, at the end of it. So Musterion means church. It's a nickname for church that Paul invented. The mystery, hidden in God, unknown, there wasn't even going to be a church, but Israel rejected Christ, so that's how come church gets called out. That's why Matthew 16, 18 is Christ saying, Upon myself, epitaute de Petre, not Peter, I will build. I will build my church, not Peter will build. I will build. Okay? So now we have the second Arles Council. Well, that's church. Or they're telling themselves they're church. Fake church. Here we go. Fake church. Now the second Arles Council is in 319. And here's details that you can see what kind of laws they passed and the things that they did. Okay? As a result of it. A lot of people call this Arles Council in 319 the first one. It's really the second one. Okay. And so here at 4thCentury.com, which is where the link is to the laws, okay, where you see how they cannibalize each other, they think they call that the first official Arles Council, Council, but it wasn't. The first one was in 314. And you can find that out here in that link to RomanEmpress.org. All right. So this is technically the second, but 4thCentury.com considers it the first. Maybe because they're measuring it after Constantine finished all of his battles with Licinius. But he really hadn't finished his battles with Licinius then either. So it's really the second Arles Council. But see, church. We're church. We determine who the books of the Bible are. We determine whether your faith is pure or not. We determine whether you're a heretic or not. And we determine whether you die or not. And that's when these laws, that's what these laws are. Go look them up. That's what they do. This is under Constantine, not a pagan. It's no longer Diocletian. Diocletian dies. Actually, he dies Mu. In the next, the next syllable, he dies at Mu. And I'm not sure what to say about that. There's a, a big long debate by T. D. Barnes about whether whether Diocletian died in 316. They, Barnes thinks that he died at 313, which would be here. Mm, Ram. Okay. See, because that's 315, 14, 13. T.D. Barnes maintains that Diocletian died there. Written. In the middle of written. Make of that what you will. But most Roman historians, classically, and Paul too, because Paul picks his third Ada of Telemachus for Diocletian. He's a moo. He's just a moo. Or you can say moose. Okay, Terion, 
Mustadion is how we usually pronounce it. He's just a move. He's just a letter of the alphabet. Okay, and, and, and mu, mu in Hebrew, of course, means dead. And, you know, John knows how to speak Hebrew, too. So there's, it, it's kind of cute. Alright, but I'm not quite sure how much he's referencing the Oakley so much as fake church. Which is very obvious from the end of it. Okay. And I'm only using one word here because it, this is in a positive. See, the names were written. This is the first name. Mystery. Second name. Babylon the, the Great. Third name. Mother of Harlots. Fourth name. And of the Bla and of the abominations of the earth. So it's actually four names. This is the first name, so it's in a positive clause, even though it's just a noun. All right, and he's tagging Paul each time. I didn't check to see if he's tagging Paul here. But each of these sevens, and these are the only times that the text will seven from here on out until the end. Okay, so now we get to 326, and it's even worse, but I my voice is giving, so I've got to stop for now.